My name is Amory Walsh and I am a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the School of Arts, English and Languages in Queen's University, Belfast. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to share my work on the 17th century boils and in particular to draw on the surviving papers to imagine what it might have been like to be a child in one of the best known and highest achieving of early modern families. So I will start off by providing some background details on the Boyle family and their wider significance in the context of early modern Ireland. I will go on to describe the type of upbringing and the educational model which the Boyle children would have followed, while also revealing the different kinds of opportunities which were afforded to the boys in comparison with their sisters. I have picked out some letters which will help to illustrate the conscious way in which the Boyle children's writing skills were nurtured and developed through the medium of the familial correspondence network. And I'll finish up by demonstrating how one Boyle daughter applied her writerly skills to mark a pivotal moment in the family's history, while also managing to carve out an identity of her own. Along the way, I will show some lovely pictures, keeping in mind how different forms of remembrance can be used to reconnect with the past and to better understand our place in the present. So in answer to the question, who were the Boyles and why were they significant? I would like to draw your attention to one of three funerary tombs, which the new English planter Richard Boyle built as a form of memorialization and as a way of publicizing his family's manifold successes in Ireland. So this tomb, which you can see here, is located in St. Mary's Collegiate Church in Yall, County Cork. The monument was first erected by Richard Boyle in 1620, after which he made some further changes, either in 1642 or 1643. Now, the figurines which are represented along, um, just underneath Richard Boyle, who's um, lying uh, on his side here, the figurines represent 10 of the children who were born by 1619 when the monument was being built. Long before that time, uh, in 1588, Richard Boyle arrived in Ireland as part of the Elizabethan plantation of Munster. During the course of his Munster-based activities, which involved checking land titles and overseeing four features to the crown, Boyle also took advantage of any and every opportunity to acquire his own lands. His two marriages, first to Joan Apsley, who you can see on the left of the monument, um, uh, and later to Catherine Fenton, the lady on the right, um, enabled Boyle, with the aid of his wife's land and cash diaries, to establish an immense property portfolio and to work towards consolidating his position as a resident peer. As a measure of his rapid rise, uh, conservative estimates suggest that by 1640, Richard Boyle was one of the largest and richest landowners in the Three Kingdoms. Now, Boyle's second wife, Catherine, um, also immersed herself in the business of creating a substantial legacy, as you can see here, by giving birth to 15 children, 12 of whom survived into adulthood, comprising of seven daughters, Alice, Sarah, Latisse, Joan, Catherine, Dorothy and Mary, and five sons, Richard, Louis, Roger, Francis and Robert. Thus, while the effigies in Cork and in Dublin St. Patrick's Cathedral are still an impressive reminder of the family's dynastic strength and powerful presence in early modern Ireland, the monuments themselves prompted me to think about the less well-known figures in the family and how the recovery of those other voices through the retrieval of their writings might offer new insights on one of the most turbulent but also exciting periods in our history. I was also curious to know more about the Boyle women and their children um, and how they might have wished to remember their own lives and their roles and relationships in perhaps 17th century Ireland's most famous family. And during subsequent searches of various libraries and private archives, I've discovered that an unusually large amount of the Boyle's extant papers relate to the women. Perhaps unsurprisingly, much of the content of those writings revolves around family matters. It is also noticeable that some of the children's writings have survived, including, for example, four of the grandchildren's letters. 
51 of the Boyle Sons letters are extant and date from 1630 to 1642, during which time the five boys wrote home from school and university and while being chaperoned across Europe. The survival of the women's and children's correspondence was, however, largely determined by the fact that many of those letters were addressed to the head of the family, which greatly improved their chances of being registered, retained and preserved in the longer term. Now, Richard and Catherine Boyle followed the rule of primogeniture, which meant that they needed to produce healthy sons in order to ensure that the family's valuable lands were safely transmitted onwards. The imperative, this imperative likely explains the number as well as the narrow intervals between Catherine Boyle's 15 pregnancies in 23 years. Immediately following each of those births, a wet nurse was employed to provide nutrition in lieu of the maternal breast, which facility also freed Catherine up for the next pregnancy. As was also typical of aristocrats of that period, some of the Boyle children were fostered out to suitable families for part of their upbringing. Daughters Alice, Mary and Margaret spent several years with Colonel and Lady Clayton, who were also neighbours and close associates of the Boyles. Mary, who later became the Countess of Warwick, acknowledged in her autobiography that while her mother had died when she was very young, Lady Clayton had ensured that she was soberly educated. Apart from providing a religiously themed education, noble daughters like the Boyle girls were also instructed how to write letters, how to speak and write in the French language, how to occupy themselves with needlework, how to engage in polite conversation and how to run a large household. Two of the other sisters, Dorothy and Catherine, were each sent off at the ages of eight and nine respectively to live with their intended in-laws. Such moves were not unusual and, according to Jane Olmar, girls living in Ireland of high aristocratic rank were customarily sent to comparable families in England to prepare them for their future lives as wives and mothers. And in this slide here, um, I have a little excerpt from Richard Boyle's diary for the 25th of August, 1626, in which he records um, that several members of the Loftus family had arrived in Waterford um, with the purpose of collecting Dorothy, um, Richard Boyle's eight-year-old daughter. Um, and uh, the idea was that they were going to bring Dorothy back to um, Rathfarnham Castle and there she would be brought up with the Loftus family. Um, a marriage contact, contract had been agreed. So the photograph on the left hand side is probably Dorothy's last view of Lismore Castle in Waterford. It's the gatehouse there. And on the right, we have um, Rathfarnham Castle as it stands today. And that would have become Dorothy's natal or marital home. So whilst Dorothy would have left Lismore in September uh, 1626, um, she didn't go on to marry Arthur until, 16, until February 1632. Um, so she you know, had her education there in Rathfarnham. It's interesting to note that um, in the record of Dorothy's departure, uh, Richard Boyle also confirms that a French woman accompanied Dorothy on this trip. And perhaps we can assume that this French woman was a companion and governess as well to, to Dorothy. So um, signs of the impact of primogeniture are also evident in the amounts of money which Richard Boyle invested in his son's education. Letters and financial accounts confirm that professional tutors were a constant presence in the Boyle household with the aim of readying the boys for formal schooling. It is, however, um, plausible that the three Boyle girls who remained in the natal home, Sarah, Latisse and Joan, might have benefited from the type of text-based learning which was taking place within that same domestic space. Around the age of nine, the boys were dispatched to school and then onwards to university in England, after which they completed their education with a grand tour of Europe. 
Correspondence from the sons and their tutors provides lots of details about consumables, such as their clothing and food and the type of curriculum which was followed, including, for example, learning to speak French and write in Latin, studying scripture, history, rhetoric, logic, mathematics and geometry, as well as being taught how to dance, play music and fence. Much like the system followed by their sisters, this programme of learning was designed with the future in mind. And for the boys, um, they would be required to function in the public sphere and take on leadership positions, both locally and regionally. So while the upbringing which the boys experienced was consistent with their privileged class and Protestant creed, the family's surviving papers also tellingly reveal the importance which was seemingly attached to the skill of writing. Writing was part of the fabric of everyday living for the boils, and both the boys and girls learned to use their pens from an early age, equipping them for their future roles, but also enabling them to stay in touch with other family members, irrespective of the temporal gaps or geographic distances. Now, this notion of connectivity is demonstrated in four letters, which were separately written by Catherine Jones and her cousins, Catherine, Latisse and Kildare Digby to their grandfather, the first Earl of Cork. It can be estimated that the letters were written sometime mid-1639 when the Earl was staying at Stalbridge Manor in Dorset. A quick examination of the letters confirms that the grandchildren were being brought up in the same patriarchal tradition as their parents. And in front of you here are images of two letters um, on the left written by Catherine Digby, who would have been about 11 at the time, and her sister Latisse on the right, um, who would have been about 10 at the time when she wrote this letter. So the material appearance of each of the letters underlines both the effort and the desire to impress the recipient, as is signalled by the careful spacing of the script on the page, the neat italic hand, and the respectful tone of the letter's content. The letters offer some further clues as to how early modern children might have been taught the mechanics of writing and how to adhere to a formula of words um, before graduating on to the matter of composition. And in this slide here, you can see um, an image of Kildare Digby's letter. Um, so if you look closely, you can see that it's written in Latin and um, the page is ruled. Um, and at the time, Kildare Digby would have been about eight. Um, and you, you can also perhaps spot some spelling errors there in the address. So you might perhaps agree that while Catherine Jones may have been the youngest of the correspondents, and Catherine was born in December 1633 at, at Lone Castle, she certainly manages to uh, endear herself by adopting a, a transparent approach um, with an admission that, and I'll quote from her letter, which you can see here now, I am now a learning to write, but cannot yet write to be understood. Otherwise, I would crave your Lordship's blessing in my own lines, which when I'm able to present your Lordship with all, you shall receive my first fruits, unquote. All four of the letters were subsequently endorsed with an acknowledgement of the individual correspondent's name. It is also reasonable to assume, based on the excellent physical condition of these letters, that they were cherished and carefully preserved, probably for sentimental reasons. Now, more than 40 years later and a further generation on, the archives provide another example which indicates that acquiring the skill of writing continued to be actively encouraged through the medium of the familial correspondence network. In a letter dated the 3rd of May, 1681, Charles Boyle wrote to his mother, the second Countess of Cork, and I have an excerpt here. Um, and towards the end of that correspondence, Charles draws his mother's attention to an enclosure which his daughter Molls or Mary had insisted that he include. According to Charles, the attachment from Molls was her first essay, while further explaining that the 11 year old had promised, quote, in a few days to write better and then she will venture to write to your ladyship, unquote. Charles's willingness to indulge Moll's desires 
and his palpable pride in her writerly endeavours is compounded by his expectation that his mother would also be complicit in her capacity as a receptive audience. The reference to Mal's enclosure also underscores how the Boyles and their extended families continue to foster the skill and the ambition to write better. Additionally, while sadly it appears that Mal's essay has not survived, the mention of her labours does reveal how writing is imagined as a unifying force in affirming a common interest, a valued heritage and a sense of belonging. Now I want to turn to this final archival gem um, to show how one of the Boyle daughters seems to have understood how to use the opportunity of writing to strengthen her connection with the intended reader and to assert an identity of her own. This letter was written on the 9th of July 1637 by 12 year old Mary Boyle on the entreaty of her foster mother Lady Clayton to inform her father, the Earl of Cork, about the circumstances in which the youngest member of the family, eight-year-old Margaret Boyle, had died from a tedious sickness on the 28th of June. It seems that the letter was designed to comfort and to reassure her father that, quote, there was nothing wanting uh, in the care and attention which Margaret had received, either from the Claytons or from her doctors. Yet, while the reader is afforded only a fleeting glimpse at young Margaret and her sweet sobriety, the bearer of the sad news and the holder of the pen Mary is much more fulsomely and favourably portrayed. And um, we have here a portrait of Mary in later life as the Countess of Warwick. By availing of her proximity to Margaret's death and by using the facility of the letter, a version of Mary emerges espousing filial duty, sisterly devotion and a pious inclination. The letter also helps to reinforce um, how the Boyle women used writing to deal with catastrophe, to call for help, to vent their emotions, to reflect on their lived experiences and to ensure that their memory of a person or a special event was ingrained into the family records. Now, just returning to the uh, monument in Mo Yall, the fortuitous survival of such texts like Mary's letter and the tomb in Yall means that those less well-known figures like young Margaret who was buried in Yall and other voices from our past can be brought back to life and reimagined and in doing so allowing us to reach a deeper and more nuanced understanding about ourselves, our closest relationships and especially about our place in the family then and now. Thank you for listening. <laughs>